so I think we do have time to get it right. Uh, but I think we would have to have a majority, uh, a, a, a super majority, really, uh, um, to uh, to move forward in that particular way. Um, but I do think that it's worth a second look and making sure um, that we are um, that we are addressing these new uh, pieces of information that have only come forward in the last couple of weeks, and we're not in the staff. that I'm not close to having votes on council. Um, I think that the, uh, I will uh, predict uh, that if the council uh, decided tomorrow, um, it would be, um, it would decide uh, with uh, almost a split decision uh, with one side winning by one or, or two votes, either side. Um, and I'm pretty good at counting, as you know. Uh, so uh, so I, my concern is that that's a lose for everybody. It's not good for our city not to have a consensus on how to move forward for our, uh, for our grandchildren and their children. It's important uh, that we all get on the same page and that we resolve some of the other issues that are, uh, uh, that are having people choose the wrong option, in my view, uh, for, uh, uh, for us, in their case, uh, thinking about some of their, their problems. And so we need to address those problems and those are problems of congestion. Yes. Well, well cer uh, certainly, um, I, I would never, uh, it's interesting how you present this at your side or someone else's side, because I can say, that there's a number of members of executive um, who um, are in favor of, uh, of the renewal. Uh, there are a number of uh, others from all of the ge geography of the city and not from one political persuasion. So when you ask the question, will I and my side question the hybrid, I would say, no, 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 I'm going to answer your question. I would say that the people right here will be the people will be in, uh, in the court uh, at arbitration. It won't be members of council. It will be the people who are affected. And I absolutely think they will be. Uh, Pam, if I, if I could just add to that yes, thank a little you. bit. Um, Mark I, I think the environmental assessment process is perhaps not well understood. Um, whatever comes out of this is subject to a public process by the province um, at which people can depute, they can intervene, they can debate, they can uh, dispute the findings of any environmental study. And the environmental study has to go back to the original provincially approved terms of reference. So the ultimate decision on the environmental assessment is in fact a provincial decision that is subject to a very rigid and very structured process uh, full of opportunity for the public to participate, and I'm sure they will. Um, and so it's not about uh, any need to go to court. You just have to follow the process. We're on step three of seven. That being said, Pam, if I could, yes. this 100-year decision council is facing right now really the be all and end all is what process to go through. Could this be another situation where council ends up making a decision and making another decision and then backtracking on that decision which we've seen many times. Yes, and what we do know about an environmental assessment um, is as it proceeds uh, through the next, um, of the next four steps, which could take quite a significant amount of time if there's disagreement, um, uh, what we do know is that even if you choose one that does not fit all of those five criteria, you must mitigate um, the criteria that is not being uh, address. So it isn't as if those are just wannabes or should be so wouldn't it be nice to have. Those are the requirements of the choice that we must make. Um, so if we choose something that doesn't fit any of those requirements, then we'll go into Never Neverland of the minister um, and the provincial regulations, uh, as they explained in my town hall, uh, having, uh, having to uh, 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 reject uh, the proposal that's been put forward. So that's why I'm saying it's very important, not just for my side or other sides, but very important for the city.
to make sure that whatever it is that we choose actually fits those five environmental criteria. And I think um, that that's, uh, that, that's a bottom line um, uh, for the Minister of the Environment and the Ministry of the Environment. And if we don't do that, then we'll be out mitigating all of this for three or four, five years. And by that time, uh, perhaps uh, we'll have to, uh, it either will fall down or we will have to uh, uh, put in the option that was not recommended. After all, the only option so far that's been recommended uh, is in the previous staff report, which recommended during the... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Would it be my size? <laughs> for a, a, an actual station uh, uh, where we're building a whole new neighborhood uh, above and below. Um, we, uh, we know that the LRT along the waterfront um, is, uh, is under discussion uh, and has been committed to uh, by quite a number of members of the government. Um, and, and I'm going to have Paul speak to this as well. But, but what we also know is in the meantime, we have, in the design of Queen's Key, built the busway. So it isn't as if uh, we're not ready for that. Of course we're ready for that. So whether it's uh, in the interim of a busway or in the next five or, or seven years, uh, the build out of the LRT, we are already looking at how we would do the LRT on our own given the lands and the value of the lands that are being unlocked here. Uh, we have developers who have been told that that LRT will be there. So we are going to have to deliver it as a city, and we would be able to do that uh, uh, 
uh, just on the um, on the um, uh, on the uh, what do we call them? The de development charges alone would be able to to do that. So when people talk about it as if it's not possible, of course it's possible. Um, I, you know, I. Uh, Five years ago, would have never thought that we would have been as far down the road on Regent Park and on uh, West Pond lands as we are, um, and uh, that's just the way it works. Jason, did you want to add something, and then Paul will. Paul, you want to go first? Yep. Yeah, sure. So this is a really important question about transit. You know, uh, the only way we're going to continue to meet the growth projections of our city and the region through massive investment in every form of transit. I'm going to be a couple of numbers. We're now 2.8 million as a city. At Amalgamation, we were 2.4. We're the only city in North America that's added almost half a million people in that short span of time. We're probably going to be around 3.3, 3, 3 3.5 million by 2041. And this greater Golden Horseshoe is going to be 13.5 million. Just put that in context. New York City is 8.4. You add Jersey and Connecticut, it's about 16. We're going to be a totally different place. And we are uh, absolutely have to be focused, laser sharp, on getting every form of transit. If you go to the province, we all know what's been happening. Electrification of the has been approved. Funding uh, <coughs> happening to electrify the trains, the smart track concept, the go train every 15 minutes, uh, LRTs. Uh, a subway in the right place, uh, new buses, all that kind of stuff. We have no choice. If we don't do that, we're going to absolutely just totally stand still. And so I personally, given all my experience in this building, I'm very confident that people are going to possess that agenda and make it happen. And it has to happen. It's, it's the only option. And so that's why that assumption was put in here. Paul. Oh, sorry. There's, there's an important thing. And there's, if I could just add a little fact that the modeling for both options yeah. assume the transit. Yes. So <laughs> if in fact we don't build the transit, to Paul's point, the city grinds to a halt. Period. Yes. Whether you, whether no matter what you do, whether you lead the the, the gardener up or you take it down. So both the modeling that Dylan did in both cases assume the transit. Okay, and I think that Jason, yeah. uh, uh, introduce yourself and... Sure, it's, uh, it's Jason Lester, um, Senior Vice President of uh, Game Unlimited Corp, which was formerly uh, Mendy Realty Corporation. We've, we were probably one of the larger developers. I've been in uh, the downtown east for over 10 years. Uh, the Distillery District, the Pan Am Games, uh, Athletes Village, starting up with Streetcar and about eight projects there. Um, probably responsible for a few million square feet uh, in total that we've either completed or in process we're about to do. One of the things that we looked at is not just whether this is good for our, our, our communities, but with the distillery district, which attracts um, visitors from not just downtown Toronto, but the greater part of Toronto, where congestion or added congestion could be an issue. Um, there's no question we're, we're in favor of this initiative. Um, my question to Paul is, which I thought was an excellent um, your presentation is, you know, you've got some great examples of around the, around the world where cities have removed uh, mass transit for cars. I can't think of an example where, where the cities have regretted taking something down or stopped it halfway like we have with the Allen Expressway, where we said this was the wrong thing to do looking back 10, 20, 30 years. So I'm just throwing it out there for you, Paul or anyone else. No, it, it's important. That's why I said, if council decides to build this hybrid, we'll be the only city in the face of the earth building this elevated water for an expressway. And I'm serious about my climate laughing stock of the world, honestly. Uh, all those cities that were listed in that Congress for new urbanism slide that I had up there, I showed you the ones that have bitten the bullet. Big ones, important. New York, Seoul, Korea, etc. There are other cities in there that had the same debate, and they decided, oh, no, no, we can't do it. We're going to keep it up. You know what they are? Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Detroit. <laughs> <laughs>